So here we're going to talk about the pericardial diseases. So we've done a section on the myocardial diseases or the cardiomyopathy. So those are diseases infecting, uh, affecting the myocardium. Now we're going to move on to the pericardium, which is really three distinct layers. You've got the visceral layer, which is intimately associated with the myocardium. You've got a pericardial cavity, which is uh, potential space. Uh, that can be filled with fluid, and we'll talk about that when we talk about pericardial effusions. And then we've got a more fibrous layer, which is the outer layer, and that's the parietal layer uh, of the pericardium. So we have fibrous pericardium and viscerous, visceral pericardium, and then they're divided by a pericardial sac or cavity. This is going to be what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about acute pericarditis, which is an acute inflammation of the pericardium. We're going to talk about effusions, so that's when fluid collects in that sac. And then we're going to talk about constrictive pericarditis, which has some similarities to restrictive cardiomyopathy, uh, but we'll talk about that when we get there. So acute pericarditis is plainly put an inflammation of the uh, pericardial tissue. So usually we don't know why this happens, but when we can pinpoint a, ca a cause, usually it's infectious. Usually it uh, succeeds a viral infection, sometimes fungal, but usually it will uh, come after a viral infection. It can be inflammatory due to any kind of autoimmune process, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, it can be metabolic. So patients who have low kidney function and who develop high creatinine, high BUN, they can develop pericarditis as well. Uh, a recent MI can, can cause pericarditis uh, in, the, in the months following the MI, and that's simply due because uh, when the heart cells die, they expose new antigens, and the pericardium doesn't recognize those, an those antigens, and it causes an, auto, uh, an immune response, and that's called Dressler syndrome. Metastatic cancer can also, uh, the, the cancer cells can migrate to the pericardium and that can uh, cause a, an inflammatory reaction there. So what these all have in common is that they're inflammatory, either idiopathic or due to a uh, identifiable cause. Number one cause though is idiopathic. So the most common cause that we know of, so when we do know a cause, the most common identifiable cause, it's, a, it's due to a viral infection. Um, so that should, it should say the most common cause is idiopathic, but the most common cause when we know there is a cause is a viral infection. Other causes were, as I mentioned earlier, the damage leads to the inflammatory process. And there's really two things that come out of this that are problematic. First of all, when the pericardium is inflamed and irritated, there are nerves around there. And so anytime you have inflammatory mediators around nerves, that's going to create pain. And the pain that comes with this is going to be positional and pleuritic. And of course, it's going to be in the chest because the pericardium is in the chest. Why is it positional? Well, the pericardium is a sac, and it's not a tight sac. It's a, a, a sac that's loose. It allows the heart to move. It's supposed to allow the heart to move. So different positions are going to affect the nerves in different ways. So moving around is going to cause chest pain. It's pleuritic because, well, when you breathe, you're causing the pericardium to move. You're, comp you're causing compression of the pericardium or you're allowing for expansion of the pericardium. So changes in position and breathing will trigger this chest pain. Now these patients, they tend to be in a most comfortable position while sitting up. So that's something to keep in mind. If you come into the ER, the patient has chest pain and they're sitting up, that could possibly be acute pericarditis. If they're laying down, probably not. So the pain is relieved by sitting up. Another problem that acute pericarditis causes is that the pericardium itself will, be, will become stiff and non-compliant because of the inflammatory mediators, because there may be a little bit of an effusion. And so you'll hear heart sounds um, of, of which is really the heart motioning across the pericardium. And that's going to cause what's known as a pericardial friction rub. And I'm going to try to simulate that here. I'm going to turn my volume up so you can hear it. Hopefully this, the quality of this is good.
So here is an example of acute pericarditis, and you're not going to get to these kinds of histology questions on the USMLE. What I, what I put here on the left is normal pericardium. So you have your myocardium here, and then what it looks like you have here is sort of a layer of, uh, uh, of your uh, uh, parietal pericardium, or sorry, your visceral pericardium. And then what it looks like you have here is your sac, and then this is your parietal pericardium. So you have a sac and you have two layers of pericardium. And then here's your myocardium. Now here we have an infection. And you can see that because we've got, we've got white blood cells inside our, our, our pericardium. Here, here, here we've got some red blood cells collected in our sac. So this is bad. We'll talk about the different causes of this. Here again, you have inflammation of the pericardium. It shouldn't be this thick. It should only be about this thick. So the uh, history you should look for in any question stem with a patient where you might suspect acute pericarditis is risk factors for pericarditis. So a patient who's had a recent viral infection, a patient who's had recent MI, a patient who has cancer, undergoing radiation, the patient who has renal failure, active renal failure, uh, systemic lupus, or any autoimmune disorder. The symptoms are going to be what tips you off. This is going to be a patient who comes into the ED with chest pain, but the chest pain is relieved when they're sitting up, so clearly they're going to be, talk to you, talking to you in a sitting up position. They're not going to be laying down. And their respiratory rate might be somewhat rapid because the more they breathe in, the harder they breathe in, the worse that pain gets because they're pulling harder, pulling and pulling harder on that pericardium. So this is going to be a patient sitting up, complaining of chest pain that is worsened by breathing and worsened by laying down or any kind of motion. On physical exam, you'll hear that pericardial friction rub. And that pericardial friction rub is pathognomonic, but it's not always heard in some patients. So some things also to look for are a low-grade fever, which can also be present because of this inflammation, as well as a borderline low pulse ox. And the pulse ox isn't low for any other reason than that this patient is in a respiratory acidosis. They're not breathing enough. They're breathing at a, uh, they may be breathing at a rapid rate, but they're breathing very, very uh, shallowly, and that's just to prevent the pain. So they may have a borderline low pulse ox, 91, 92, 93. Of course, they're not going to be in the 80s, but, but uh, another thing to look for. So low-grade fever uh, and borderline low pulse ox. These patients aren't really going to appear sick, but they're going to be in pain, and that pain is going to be uh, pleuritic chest pain. So the best way to diagnose when you suspect acute pericarditis, of course, you've. this is assuming that we know this is pleuritic chest pain that's positional in nature. So once we know that, we know it's not an acute MI because an acute MI is never uh, pleuritic or positional. Pleuritic positional pain, though, should still get an EKG because you will have EKG findings that will diagnose acute pericarditis. And what you'll see on EKG are diffuse PR depression and sometimes diffuse ST elevation. But, uh, but um, actually, I should reword that. Diffuse PR depression sometimes, and all the time, you're going to see diffuse ST elevation. Remember, on an MI, you'd see ST elevation and maybe three or four leads. But on acute pericarditis, you're going to see diffuse ST elevation on every lead. And that, that shouldn't happen in MI. That's typical for acute pericarditis, diffuse ST elevation. Once you've made the diagnosis of acute pericarditis, your next step should be to get an echocardiography. And the echo is good because you can determine the extent of the infusion. Almost all patients with acute pericarditis will have an effusion, so you want to know how much of an effusion there is. So just in case you have to drain off some of that fluid, you can go ahead and do that. So EKG is your first step, and then echocardiography would be your next step after that. Okay, so if they ask you what's the next step in the management of this patient, it's EKG. As far as treatment, we want to treat their pain, but we also want to treat the inflammation. So we give them aspirin and NSAIDs. That would be the best treatment, aspirin and NSAIDs. 
And we can also add corticosteroids if we need to, if it's a very severe acute pericarditis. Aspirins and NSAIDs, plus or minus steroids. Okay, so here's a normal EKG. Notice we have our P wave, QRS complex, T wave. We don't have any ST elevation or depression. Now look at this one. Now you would normally, you would look at this in a patient with chest pain and you think, oh my gosh, ST elevation, this patient must be in STEMI. And you'll, you'll go down the list, V1, you'll see, okay, it's V1, it's V2, it's V3, oh, must be an anterior, uh, anteroseptal MI. Then you look, oh, well, V4 is elevated, V5 is elevated, V6 is elevated, and AVF kind of might be elevated too, and 1 is elevated, and 2 is elevated. This is not an MI. This is acute pericarditis. Put this together with a patient that has put positional and pleuritic chest pain, definitely acute pericarditis. Okay, so pericardial effusions can uh, occur with or without acute pericarditis. So let's talk about pericardial effusions. So pericardial effusion is not a diagnosis. It's just simply a clinical manifestation of a, of a disease. And there are many different underlying causes that can lead to pericardial effusions. Uh, it may present in the acute pericarditis patient, but it doesn't have to, and vice versa. Chronic patients are more stable than acute patients. And what that means is that if this is a pericardial effusion that's developed slowly over days, over weeks, over months, the heart can adapt and you're not gonna have any major clinical problems. Eventually you will, but in, in the interim, you're not gonna have any immediate problems. However, if for instance, you're a post-MI patient and you have a ventricular free wall rupture and you're now bleeding at at 50 milliliters per, per minute into your pericardial sac, you'll have a sudden death due to cardiac tamponade. So big wide range here. Chronic patients with pericardial effusions much more stable than acute pericardial effusion. Uh, invariably, pericardial effusions come from damage done from the pericardium, either from the inside or the outside. So it could be due to infiltration, it could be edema into the pericardial space, it could be neoplasm uh, infiltrating the pericardium causing an inflammation, or it could be due to uh, a blunt trauma to the chest. So really any trauma upon the chest or any inflammation of the pericardium, either of these can cause pericardial effusions. There's many, many, many causes. And the major symptoms when you have a pericardial effusion and it's symptomatic, uh, and we're going to talk about this, the, the, the prima donna of this is the, the, uh, the uh, cardiac tamponade. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, the major symptoms that come from this are going to be uh, due to the resistance that the fluid, the blood, whatever you have in the effusion, the resistance that that puts on the heart, and it inhibits its abil the heart's ability to expand and fill with blood during diastole. And that's going to result in shock and then death. So on physical examination, when you have a patient with a pericardial effusion, your history isn't going to be very helpful because there's such a wide range of things that can cause pericardial effusions. Transudative effusions are, are always pressure in nature, so a, uh, a high blood pressure or a low oncotic pressure, so like hypoalbuminemia or malnutrition, uh, those can cause a transudative effusion. Of course, you're not going to know what the effusion is just looking at it. You'd have to, you'd have to draw it out. An exudative effusion would be something from injury or trauma inside um, or outside, I guess. Serosanguinous effusion would be something like uh, a uh, TB or neoplasm getting into the pericardial uh, tissue. And then frank blood would be uh, trauma, aortic aneurysm, dissection. Uh, that would be your cardiac tamponade. So the physical signs you're going to look for in pericardial effusion, and for the USMLE, I want you to pay special attention to two different kinds of patients. The patient who had blunt chest trauma, so they don't have anything sticking out of them, or it could, it could be one of those patients. The patient who has chest trauma, and the patient who is two, three, four days post-MI. 
The, the physical exam signs that you want to look out for are muffled heart sounds, that pericardial friction rub that we just talked about, an elevated jugular venous pressure, so where you're seeing jugular venous distension way up their neck, and in extreme cases, unstable hemodynamics, uh, low blood pressure, loss of consciousness. So the presence of a pericardial effusion is generally found during the workup for pericarditis or in a trauma physical. So we always look for pericardial effusions in a trauma physical. And in pericarditis, in acute pericarditis, this is one of the reasons we do an ultrasound. So provided that the patient is stable, as long as they're not dying on you, got your A, Bs, and Cs covered, then echocardiography is the best test of choice uh, when you have a patient that may have a pericardial effusion. And when I say may have a pericardial effusion, I mean the patient has muffled heart sounds or elevated jugular venous pressure with no other apparent cause of that. And the echocardiography helps us determine the extent of the effusion. As far as treatment for pericardial effusion, if we need to, we can aspirate fluid out of the pericardial sac and then we want to manage the underlying cause. So here's the types of pericardial effusions. The transudative pericardial effusions are usually due to congestive heart failure from fluid overload or from hypoalbuminemia. The exudative pericardial effusions are due to chest injury or trauma. The serosanguinous, so like the, it may say pink fluid was, uh, was aspirated uh, out of the pericardial sac. That would be infiltration of the myocardium. That can cause a pericardial effusion. So particularly TB and neoplasms uh, tend to infiltrate the myocardium and pericardium uh, frequently. And then frank blood. Obviously, frank blood is going to be from some kind of trauma or rupture. So coronary artery rupture, that will empty into the pericardial sac. A left ventricular free wall bleed, that is one of the complications after a heart attack a ruptured aortic aneurysm, and penetrative trauma. So this is a sano, one normal and one with a pericardial effusion. So these sanos aren't positioned exactly in the same uh, position. One looks like it's placed on the patient's back and the other one looks like it's placed on the patient's chest. But regardless, uh, all of these positions are marked out clearly. Aorta, left atrium, left ventricle, and right ventricle. Uh, as you can see here, around the uh, normal heart, you have, uh, you have no empty space. Black would mean either uh, a hollow area or fluid. White is solid structure or tissue. So we have no black around, well here we have the aorta and the aorta kind of continues back around here. So this looks like it might be placed kind of on the patient's, uh, underneath the patient's left armpit and looking looking laterally. Uh, so this is, uh, this is though no fluid around the heart. This looks like it was, uh, this might be transesophageal, um, but this is inferior here and superior here. So here we've got an effusion all around the heart. You're not supposed to have this black area here. So this is effusion. Fluid is going to show up as black on ultrasound. So this is your effusion. All right. Okay, so cardiac tamponade is a specific kind of pericardial effusion that tends to come on rather quickly, particularly in trauma situations. And so we always are going to treat cardiac tamponade as an emergency situation. We're always going to have a high index of suspicion of cardiac tamponade in any patient who's received penetrative or blunt force chest injuries. But really, anything that causes pericarditis can cause uh, cardiac tamponade. So this is a rapid uh, infusion of fluid into the uh, pericardial space. But most notoriously, it tends to be blood. Uh, because it, generally, the fastest way to get fluid into the uh, pericardial space is through some kind of a hole or some kind of a traumatic uh, uh, injury. So the symptoms are going to be related on the fact that there's pressure placed externally on the heart by the fluid in the pericardial sac. So that's going to uh, inhibit the ventricles from pumping. 
as they should, from filling and pumping as they should. So because you can't fill up the ventricles, you're not going to be able to maintain a blood pressure. And so patients with cardiac tamponade, emergency cardiac tamponade, are going to have hypotension. They're also going to have left-sided heart failure because they're not going to be able to get the blood out of the left side of their heart uh, as they're not going to be able to get the blood out of their heart as efficiently because their heart can't fill as much. This should say ventricle, ventricular filling will be impaired because you have fluid surrounding you have su fluid surrounding the pericardial or in the pericardial sac, and so the heart can only fill up so much. Uh, so the patient's also going to have uh, rather quick onset of left-sided failure. So shortness of breath, dyspnea, cough, orthopnea. So if the patient has shortness of breath in consort with uh, hypotension and there's any kind of injury to the chest, you should think cardiac tamponade. But just for completion's sake, cardiac tamponade can be idiopathic, it can be due, due to infection, post-MI, uremic, radiation, etc. Cardiac tamponade, though, by definition, is a uh, accumulation of fluid in the pericardial space so quickly that it causes uh, clinical syndrome and possibly death. It's an emergent condition. So the history is any risk factor for pericarditis, particularly patients who have received direct blunt trauma to the chest. Uh, you, it, could, it could be penetrating trauma too. Uh, the symptoms will be rapidly progressing dyspnea, sh shortness of breath, cough, Jugular venous distension will be uh, will be pretty apparent in these patients because their heart can't uh, can't fill and pump properly. They're also going to have venous distension and possibly loss of consciousness if the uh, if the blood pressure has been low long enough. On physical exam, and usually you're not going to be usually your patient with cardiac tamponade is not going to be the patient that comes in and says, "Hi, doctor, how are you doing?" They're usually going to be out of it, but uh, some of the Physical signs you can see are dizziness, drowsiness, rapid breathing, uh, muffled heart sounds, pulsus paradoxus, the Kussmaul sign, cold and clammy extremities, dysphoria, and I would add coma and death. For diagnosis, if you suspect cardiac tamponade, if you have a hypotensive patient who is dyspneic and deteriorating quickly and they've had blunt trauma to the chest, uh, you should definitely get an echocardiogram, and you're going to hear the muffled heart sounds. Muffled heart sounds should really be, in and of itself, should be an automatic echocardiogram. You're also going to want to get an EKG on these patients because it's going to confirm your diagnosis. But you want to get an EKG on any patient besides the fact uh, that has a heart condition. But your echocardiogram is going to be how you diagnose cardiac tamponade. The way we treat this in the emergency room setting, uh, an emergency physician or any real trained physician that has to uh, work in an emergency room, regardless of whether they're an emergency department physician or not, is going to be a pericardiocentesis. And that's simply the insertion of a needle into the pericardial space, into the pericardial sac that drains the blood off. Eventually, this patient is going to need a pericardial window, which is a surgical operation that a surgeon will do um, Emer emergently, but doesn't need to be done right away. This is the urgent treatment to save the patient's life. Here's electrical alternans that you see in an EKG with a patient that has either a very large pericardial effusion or cardiac tamponade. And electrical alternans is pretty easy to pick up. Uh, most prominently, you're going to see it in your, uh, in your precordial leads, so V1 through V6. So particularly, we see it here in V2 through V5. Um, and all it is, it's a big QRS followed by a small QRS, followed by a big QRS, followed by a small QRS. And we see it down here, too, in, in our wide reading of two. So that's electrical alternans. And that's uh, not pathognomonic for cardiac tamponade, but it's, it does occur with cardiac tamponade. Here's another example. Okay, so constrictive pericarditis is uh, the, what we're going to wrap up with. And what constrictive pericarditis is, is it's a chronic inflammation, uh, the result of a chronic inflammation of the pericardium. So 
It can be idiopathic, but usually constrictive pericarditis arises out of a patient that's had multiple instances of acute pericarditis, and now they're developing a chronic inflammatory response, and they're starting to uh, lay down fibrin in the pericardial space, and that's what leads to the symptoms. Constrictive pericarditis can come as a complication of heart surgery. Uh, so constrictive pericarditis, is, all it is patho pathologically is just fibrinization of the pericardial sac. So it restricts the movement of the myocardium. And you may think that this sounds similar to something. You may think that this sounds similar to restrictive cardiomyopathy. And if you do, you'd be right. Now let's think of what it has in common. When, remember, in restrictive cardiomyopathy, you have a difficulty of, of the heart moving in general, either contracting or relaxing. And the reason it has difficulty moving is because the myocytes of the cell, the myocytes of the heart are infiltrated with something, either inflammatory material or foreign material, uh, something that is going to make it much more difficult for the heart cells themselves to contract and expand as they should. So it's going to be more difficult for them to contract and it's going to be more difficult for them to expand. They're going to be, want to be fixed in, in place. Now let's compare this to constrictive pericarditis. Unlike uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy, constrictive pericarditis is a disorder of the pericardium, not the myocardium. It's not the heart cells. It's the pericardial sac. But it's similar because what you have is in any pericardium, you have intimate connection with the myocardium. And so because you have this fibrous layer, this fibrous inflammatory layer uh, of the pericardium that's intimately attached to the myocardium, it's going to be more difficult for the heart to expand because it has to expand against a pressure, and it's going to be more difficult for it to contract because it has to pull an inflamed fibrinous pericardium. So just like restrictive cardiomyopathy, constrictive pericarditis is going to wind up in a heart that wants to stay still and in stasis. And it's for this reason that we're going to have both left-sided and right-sided symptoms prominent in patients with constrictive pericarditis. So patients will tend to present early on, and that will be with shortness of breath, dyspnea, orthopnea, and eventually through their disease course, they'll progress to increase abdominal girth, ascites, hepatosplenomegaly, and peripheral edema. So the diagnostic test of choice in a patient with uh, where you're suspecting constrictive pericarditis is the echocardiogram. However, a lot of times the echocardiogram is not going to tell us the difference between constrictive pericarditis and restrictive cardiomyopathy. There's just way too many similarities. So the way we differentiate the two of these is by history. One, your patient with restrictive cardiomyopathy is going to be far more likely to have sarcoidosis, amyloidosis, hemochromatosis, scleroderma, uh, history uh, and exposure to radiation things that affect the myocardium, whereas patients with constrictive pericarditis are more likely to have uh, uh, multiple instances of acute pericarditis or a prior history of surgery, or we don't know what the reason is. So that's something to keep in mind. Your history can give you a hint, but definitively after echocardiogram, we want to usually get a definitive diagnosis. And the way we do this is through cardiac MRI. We want to actually be able to distinguish the myocardium from the pericardium. And you can see here, this is a normal heart, you can see here that the myocardium is the sort of blackish gray. Here's your interventricular septum, and here's your normal, thin, normal, white, whitish pericardium. Now let's contrast that. Here's your normal here. And now here, you've got a much thicker pericardium. And here you actually have an effusion. And you have a pericardium that's so thick here that it's actually attached to the rib cage. See that? It's, I don't know if that looks like the costal margin, almost the sternum that it's attached to. Actually, I'm not, I'm not sure about this page. Oh, this must be, yes. OK, this is looking up at the heart. So this is attached up onto the right sternum. And then here's a pericardial effusion. This one's looking, this one's looking from, oh, this one's looking from the bottom too. Okay. 
I was thinking it was looking for the top. Never mind. Okay, this one is... Uh, I'm not sure what direction this is looking from, but it doesn't matter because here is your effusion. And here, is, again, this all this white stuff around here, not normal. Look at Do you see any white stuff around here? Just a little bit right here. All this stuff is fibrous pericardium. Again, right here, this is, uh, the intensity on this one isn't as high. Um, this, again, is looking from the bottom. Of course, it's an MRI. It should be looking from the bottom. I'm thinking about echo. Okay, so this is uh, on the left side here pointing, and here you have a little bit of an effusion, but this is going to be your thickened pericardium right here. shouldn't be like that. It should just be this little bit here. Okay, so I don't expect you to get MRI pictures on the USMLE, but uh, know uh, visually uh, what a, uh, an effusion and what uh, a thickened constrictive pericarditis looks like. Here's another one. This is obviously even thicker. Here's your, here's your heart. And this is looking laterally. There's a spine here. So this is your thickened pericardium. So, constrictive pericarditis will tend to be the patient with a history, uh, prior history of acute pericarditis, prior open heart surgery, radiation, uh, and they tend to be male. If the patient has a history, uh, the same symptoms, then they have a history of sarcoidosis or high, uh, high iron studies or scleroderma, then you should think possibly restrictive cardiomyopathy. The symptoms are going to be left-sided and right-sided, shortness of breath, dyspnea, ascites, uh, big spleen, big liver, peripheral edema. Physical exam, you'll get uh, physical signs that are consistent with your symptoms, so wheezing, rails, and ronchi, pericardial knock. I've never heard one before, but uh, I hear that it sounds a lot like an S3, so look for that. Look for an S3 kind of sound. Distant heart sounds, that's a big one, because uh, a lot of these patients do also have uh, uh, effusions, as we saw in the MRI. Apical impulse will be difficult to appreciate. That's a good one. So remember where to look for your apical impulse, your point of maximal impulse. It should be at the fifth intercostal space, the left fifth intercostal space, at the uh, intraclavicular line. Mid, sorry, midclavicular line. So fifth intercostal space, feel down five spaces, and then at the middle of the clavicle. And that's where your, your, uh, your apical impulse should be. And if you don't feel it there, either they have uh, cardiomegaly or they have constrictive pericarditis. Or they have situs inversus, which is not important for this. That's where all your organs are flipped around. Okay, so the diagnosis for constrictive pericarditis initially will be echocardiography. Uh, but usually we're going to need a chest MRI to confirm the diagnosis of constrictive pericarditis. I will say, though, that constrictive pericarditis is much more common than restrictive cardiomyopathy. EKG will not show the universal ST elevations that you would see in acute pericarditis, so that will never be the right answer. EKG will not help you. Even though in acute pericarditis, EKG will, will be very useful because you'll see all those ST elevations. And the treatment for constrictive pericarditis is a pericardiectomy. That's something that the heart surgeon does, so we're not going to talk about it here.